Hi everyone, welcome. Welcome to the first in what will be, I think, a series within the Best Elder Care series, where we look at what role Tai Chi can play in dementia care. Uh, you may have seen before the session that I sent out an email with an article that Gary and I had put together, where we just paint a picture and kind of try to uh, outline the landscape where there's a, a, a wide array of uh, research experience, of course, uh, or in the area of Tai Chi and just health and healthy aging, aging well. Then there's another body of research which uh, is looking at uh, use of Tai Chi, the role that Tai Chi can play in helping people in the early stages of dementia. So there's an example in the article where we have an embedded video with a researcher from the UK explaining the story, the experience of what they have seen uh, using Tai Chi in adult daycare. Um, today, what we're going to focus on with, I feel really fortunate that Gary Irwin Kenyon uh, will guide us through, I think, just his experience. And um, in that, that last stage that's outlined in the article, which is, you know, the continuation of somebody's life story for some people, uh, the piece where we'll be looking at Tai Chi and memory care. Um, Gary has had, uh, I would call, you know, yeah, illustrious career in academia, <laughs> is an author, um, Tai Chi teacher and gerontologist, and uh, one of the pioneers of narrative uh, gerontology. And I think, that, I think that his career has left a lasting impact because what I hear is, see also, is that this work around narrative gerontology is being picked up by other people and it's getting a little bit of a life of its own uh, and it's becoming part of other curricula. Whereas I think he and Bill Randall at St. Thomas were really pioneering this space. So as I hand over to you, Gary, what I think before we go into the Tai Chi part, what I think I would find valuable is if you could just share a few words around what is narrative gerontology, what's the idea behind it? And because of that will tie into the Tai Chi story, but I think that makes maybe a good starting point for us. Okay, hey, thanks, Razib, and welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Gary Irwin Kenyon, and uh, <clears throat> uh, yes, if what uh, narrative gerontology, <clears throat> excuse my voice is a little hoarse this morning, <clears throat> what narrative gerontology is about is really um, stories and looking at our lives as stories. Um, so there's uh, we can we do different ways of introducing uh, this topic. Um, for example, you can look at your life from the point of view of different themes. So perhaps we would say family or work or health, or religion, or spirituality. So those are themes that we could say are in our stories, the story of our lives. Um, the, uh, you can also look at your life, and we, with students, we introduce the idea that try to look at your own life as a story with the pieces of a typical story, which are uh, as you can imagine, would be character, plot, setting, those kinds of uh, uh, concepts from a story, from what a story is, and apply them to your lives. Um, so uh, in addition to the themes, so plot, for example, we could say, well, there's something going on. There's no good story. Uh, I was listening to uh, Eckhart Tolle yesterday, and he was talking about films. And he said, uh, really, there are three words to describe any film. Something goes wrong. 
And then he went on to talk about human lives and our lives as something goes wrong. There's always some kind of activity, not that everything's wrong, but that there's always activity plot going on in our life stories. And we might gain something by looking at our lives as a story. Um, another aspect of this is that uh, those of us who are into narrative gerontology would say that these stories, we don't just have a life story. Many of us will say, oh yeah, that's the story of my life. I, I have a life story. But we would say you are that story. So the idea there is that we understand our lives, the world, and other people really on the basis of a story, if you think about it. Um, now, you can really get drawn into this and you start seeing everything as a story, but that's possibly true. Even, even books that we read, like the Bible, uh, other spiritual books, could be seen as a story. You could even see a scientific theory as a story because someone, someone designed it uh, as a story and then it becomes something we use. So the idea is that these stories are very fundamental to who we are. Um, now, narrative care is really the practical extension of narrative gerontology. And by the way, there is a uh, literature, there's other resources that you can go to to learn more about narrative gerontology. Um, as Rosie mentioned, uh, Dr. Bill Randall and myself uh, are co-founders of many much of this work, not alone, but much of it was our, our work. And so you can find that on our websites, more, more uh, connections to that literature and those insights. Um, so narrative care is the practical extension of narrative gerontology. So that would mean that we assume that somebody's story, say somebody in long-term care or somebody, a dementia person living at home, we would assume, first of all, that they do have a story and that that story is very important to them. So then we may find a way through this approach to understand them better uh, and to uh, be able to connect with them and maybe help them better. Uh, now with dementia persons, that may or may not be verbal. Um, we may be the ones who are sort of the, uh, the holders of their story. So we need to to learn about them either if we're in a family, by family, or if we're caregivers, by learning from other people what who these people are, in addition to trying to uh, help have them speak about their own story themselves, of course. So we're kind of listening to the story of the dementia person, for example. That's narrative care in general. And uh, just to give you an example. Um, my good friend Clifford, who passed away a few years ago, was a resident at your care center in Fredericton. And he used to come to my Tai Chi classes all the time that I, that I gave at uh, your care center. And um, he didn't speak at all. He could raise one arm. And uh, if you said hi to him, he kind of would say, mm, you know, something. Um, and one day I came into the class and he was looking very unhappy. And I thought, hmm, what's going on here? So I just kind of intuited really, um, he was sitting at the back of the class and I went back and said, uh, Clifford, I think you like to sit in the front of the class, don't you? And he just grabbed and squeezed my hand and um, I brought him to the front of the class. He was happy. And from then on, he kept coming to every class and everything was fine. So that is a form of, uh, well, I go on here to speak about Tai Chi as narrative care. Um, so that's not a verbal use of narrative care, but it's trying to listen to and understand somebody's story. And a lot of that is such low tech. It's really not expensive, doesn't require degree, many, many degrees, just requires uh, a concern, a compassion, and uh, a listening. Uh, and the other benefit of narrative care is that it's not just the person, but the caregiver or whoever's helping 
or leading that person benefits from it also, from, more, from stillness, as we'll talk about more later. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, I, I think you began to allude to it. So can you explain, maybe just so that we all start from the same base, um, or yeah, explain to us what Tai Chi is? Uh, some people will have an idea, but I think it's always helpful to have an overview, as it were. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, just before I do that, there's maybe one last point that uh, narrative care could be considered uh, core care, meaning that it's just as important as uh, medication, housing, food. That's what we would argue, or I would argue, um, because if we have somebody who's really who we feel is really listening to us, we can put up with a lot of suffering and not nice things that are happening to us if we have that listening person. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, tai Chi, um, I guess with both these topics, we could speak for quite a while and there is a sure. rich, <laughs> rich background yeah. uh, of, you know, that we can refer you to for further questions or you can ask me questions. Um, but Tai Chi basically is, a, I'd say, a mind, body, spirit art. It comes from China originally, taught all over the world now, um, thousands of years old. And um, there are really three ways you can describe it. It's a healing art. So a lot of the movements you do in Tai Chi or Qigong, which is a, a related art, um, are designed in the right hands to literally heal health conditions, many different kinds of health conditions. And there's a lot of research on this now. Um, experimental research with control studies are more recent, but there's a lot of research now documenting the benefits of Tai Chi used as a uh, healthcare and as a form of medicine. Um, it's also a martial art. And some people kind of think, oh, it's a martial art. Um, but the martial art part of it, first of all, is, is very gentle. Uh, I might be paradoxical to say that, but very gentle. Um, and it's usually, it's less often taught as a martial art these days. It's more health and meditation. Um, it's a form of moving meditation. So when you see people, as many of you probably have, you see people practicing Tai Chi in the parks, not just in China anymore, but everywhere, they're doing a form of moving meditation. Um, a lot of people tell me, you know, meditation is fine, but I can't sit still. That just doesn't work for me. So Tai Chi offers an, uh, an alternative to that uh, if you do have difficulty sitting down, or if you don't, you can get both things going. So it's those three things, and some of the, uh, benefits of it, um, as are mentioned in the article that we, we wrote for today, um, there's a long list of health benefits of Tai Chi. Again, more and more of which are being documented through experimental sci you know, scientific studies. And there's a whole lot more anecdotal evidence. Um, in my classes over the many years I've taught Tai Chi, um, People say again and again how they reduce their blood pressure medication, they sleep better, they stopped taking or lowered their migraine medication, um, helped with depression and anxiety. Arthritis is a huge area, um, slows the progression of rheumatoid arthritis, for example, provides pain relief to many people. So again, the list goes, kind of on and on about the benefits that are now being recognized that have been used in China for, as I say, a couple of thousand years, really. Um, so physically, Tai Chi, you, you begin with uh, uh, a physical set of movements. You're, you're moving your body, which of course is uh, very healthy, but it also 
is uh, has a psychological aspect to it. It calms what we call the monkey mind or the hamster mind, some people call it. There are, our mind is always jumping from one thing to the next. And uh, it's true for all of us human beings and we can get in a kind of uh, a cycle of going around in circles as, we, as many of you may realize at times where we call it spinning our wheels. Um, well, you don't seem to be really getting anywhere. It's just thoughts, 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 thoughts keep coming up. So what Tai Chi offers is a kind of, um, uh, what, what I'll use, borrow from some other traditions that say the same thing, but uh, pr they give you a kind of awareness of those thoughts. Um, so we have, you know, we're made up of thoughts, emotions, and sense perceptions, right? We look around us, we're looking at what we see but with our senses. We have these thoughts and then the emotions are attached to the thoughts through energy. And it's really those energized thoughts that cause us uh, good things, but also cause us to become ill from a Chinese medicine point of view. Um, so there's a psychological thing because in Tai Chi, we, uh, we are brought to the present moment, which um, helps us to uh, kind of slow down that monkey mind or disengage it a little bit. And when that happens, we may feel more peace. So that, that's a, uh, one aspect of it. Um, I could, uh, yeah, may, perhaps I should continue with the, uh, a little bit more, Razib, is that, good? Is that okay? Sure, sure yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's good for our physical body because we're moving. It's good for our uh, psychological well-being. Um, it doesn't, it can improve uh, memory, cognition, learning. Um, and it is also uh, increasingly known as effective for things like anxiety and depression because we know that when we're in the present moment, we don't have anxiety and depression. It's, it's quite paradoxical and kind of mysterious still to me, but from personal experience too, um, you get to the present moment and the past and the future are not there. And that's what causes our depression and anxiety, either worried about the future or thinking about the past. Um, so Tai Chi is very helpful in that way as well. Um, then there are the uh, spiritual benefits of Tai Chi and the spiritual means here, sometimes people think uh, or people ask, uh, is Tai Chi a, a, attached to a particular religion? Some have even said to me, well, if it is, I can't practice it because it goes against my other religion. Um, that's not really true. Tai Chi is, associated with the philosophy, uh, Taoism, T-A-O-I-S-M, and, uh, and Lao Tzu, this character by the name of Lao Tzu is basically considered the creator or discoverer of this philosophy. Um, and what that is, is really more a way of life. It's his, his little book is just a, a series of statements that, that give us guidelines for a healthy, good life, physically, mentally, and spiritually. And then Tai Chi, of course, has kind of downloaded that into some specific guidelines for the, the actual practice of Tai Chi. So the spirituality is about, is really about this awareness. You come to the present moment, you become more aware of your where you are, and that automatically helps to slow down your, give your body benefits because Tai Chi is all about relaxing the, the joints and softness and slow movement. Um, so we end up giving ourselves uh, a break, you could say, by practicing Tai Chi. And to do that, um, in, in the tai, from a Tai Chi perspective, we say that we are, uh, Tai Chi is about Chi, about energy. So the word Tai 
refers to gateway or vehicle, and chi refers to energy. So from this perspective, we all have energy in us. Um, we know that from science now, right? That we're, we're not just made up of blood and, and ligaments and muscles. We're also made up of atoms and molecules, apparently. <laughs> I haven't seen those in myself, but, <laughs> um, but we are made up of that. So this energy permeates the whole universe. And these folks have known this for a long time. So the chi gets, is already there, but it's blocked in most of us by tension. So, and we feel pain because we're blocked. We have tension, either there's too much energy going to a certain part of the body or not enough. So by doing Tai Chi, you're relaxing, releasing that energy that's already there. And really the first sign of that, uh, I tell students in my classes that, did you feel more relaxed when you left here than when you arrived? And most of the time they say, well, yeah, I've never felt like this before, or I definitely feel more relaxed. And I said, well, there's the first step. And that's really what you just go from there, continuing to practice, continuing to relax and continuing to feel better and better. It does require a bit of uh, letting go of control so there's no, um, as an art, I mentioned earlier, it's an art form, and it's really your own art form. Um, it's your personal, your body, your mind, your spirit. There's no, really no place to get to, as with any art form, you keep learning. Musicians, painters, writers, you're always improving on your art. And it's the same with Tai Chi, you just keep showing up, and you go home and you say, oh, well, I got a little refinement of this move, or I learned this about my breathing. And I, I really love it for that reason, that there's no black belt to get to in the end, or, or um, what would you say, in the Olympics, you know, to win the, to win the gold. Tai Chi doesn't work like that. And so for those who want that, not that the other approaches are bad, it's different strokes for different folks. But Tai Chi appeals to a very wide range of of people because of the way it's set up. Um, Age-wise, level of frailty or strength, uh, as we'll go on to talk about here, dementia persons, some specific things about that. So it's very adaptable to each person. That's, that's a general uh, idea of Tai Chi. I think that's a, a fantastic uh, global and clear overview. Thank you. It, it's not easy to explain this stuff. I think it's, it's, it got me also thinking like uh, when you refer to students, you're talking to about, I think people in, you know, maybe late teens, early twenties often. And I was thinking, you know, uh, as kids, you're so vital. You have so much energy. You don't need uh, anything, right? You don't need Tai Chi. Maybe you need to hit things to get rid of some of the excess energy. And then over the years, you know, the, the, the need to understand how to tap in to this energy that you have uh, becomes more important because sometimes it becomes more and more difficult to tap into that energy. You know, it's there, but you lose, you know, you lose contact with it. And just, uh, I mean, now I start to talk from my own experience approaching 50, you know, <laughs> that, uh, you know, just to slow down, enjoy, oh, empty, you know, and, Okay, small movement, slow movement, coordinated movement, you know. <laughs> oh, there's something else happening here, you know. I don't have to try harder, you know, to be stronger, you know. Right. There's nothing. Those, um, yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting you. But, uh, there's no, uh, you know, I'm, my frame of reference isn't anything external like the Olympic gold or right, you know, right. doing this or doing that. It's just measuring me actually could be this moment of the day versus the next moment of the day versus the next moment of the day. And just that act of awareness and combined with breathing, I mean, it's wonderfully enriching. You know, you spoke about, uh, you know, this, this thing about your mind getting full. You know, I, I experience it a little bit like my mind is like a sponge that's just getting more and more full. And it's sometimes hard to find the empty bit. You know, the empty bit, I need to think about something. You know, the empty bit, I need just to get the energy to do the next thing. You know, this kind of, 
And just to stop for a moment, breathe, look at something like nature or things that you've described in your book. And wow, okay, and now I'm back again. I can do the next thing, right? Without it being something that is frictioned to try and get done or that becomes unpleasurable or, you know, that I do through pure willpower, you know, which is yeah, exactly. exhausting exactly. for a while, right? Yeah. By yeah. the way, those... 19, 20 year olds. Um, I uh, taught a course called Aging in Tai Chi at university. So they were mostly that age. And they used to say they just loved coming to that class. That was their, their break in the week because everything was so stressed and uh, pressured. And when they came to my class, of course it was an academic course. So we learned about research, but every class we did some Tai Chi. And uh, they just said over and over that was so wonderful. And it, it made me think that, you know, we talk about mindfulness a lot these days and how important it is to, it could be, and um, I guess increasingly is teaching young kids, six or seven years old, mindfulness in schools. And Tai Chi could be the same as with, it's not, I think you, very accurately described for many of us as we get older and there's a transition of our energy and, and how we may need to use it or want to use it. But these young folks can also use that sure. break, that break that you just talked about. Sure, yeah, yeah. sure, yeah, because there's so much more input indeed, yeah, and yeah. demands, yeah. If we uh, maybe use this as a moment to bridge into, so, for this group of people, uh, maybe the moving forms and, uh, you know, standing Tai Chi, uh, memorizing forms isn't so appropriate. So maybe you could explain uh, what you have in mind or you, what you've provided when you've done um, given Tai Chi classes in a memory care setting, and then go on to explain you know, the, so there's the physical, the spiritual, the, the mental benefits and how that also connects with narrative care, of course. So it's a, a big question, which I just let you kind of flow and see how that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, for, uh, <clears throat> for 15, 20 years, I was uh, 15 years in a couple of places and over 20 years in others. Um, I was teaching Tai Chi to uh, in long-term care, uh, largely in Fredericton, New Brunswick, where I was uh, also working. So some wonderful uh, care centers there, York Care Center, Windsor Court, Loch Lomond Villa in St. John. And um, they're very, they were very progressive, I think, in uh, inviting me. Uh, it, it usually happened, there's one story I can tell about how this started at um, Windsor Court. There was a woman by the name of Margaret Hamilton. Um, and she, they, I was told that they, she was very insistent that I get some Tai Chi into their nursing home. So she repeatedly was telling the staff, you have to do this. You know, she was very assertive. <laughs> so, so they decided to invite me to do a demonstration and they gathered everybody together who wanted to try it out. And uh, so I did the demonstration and quite a few said, yeah, yeah, they, we will come to uh, some more classes. And that's how it started there. And uh, then it was word of mouth and the staff, you know, sometimes we'd have staff or volunteers joining in the class. So it's a nice way for, for that to happen too, for a kind of a communal, a community around that rather than the residents here and the caregivers here and, and so on. So, um, and it would go by word of mouth over the years. So of course people would die uh, on the way. I, I had a number of students over the years that were a hundred years old or a hundred, one was 102, the oldest student I ever had. And she came to classes regularly until she died. Um, so as, as you know, those of you who work in there, uh, in that area, people do pass on and sometimes you get close to them 
and it's sad to to uh, if they're there every week for years at a time. But it's also a wonderful thing and leaves a, uh, a, an endearment and a warmth in my heart when I think about those people. So, um, so that's how it started there. And uh, I decided early on that uh, for this group, generally, I would create um, a seated Tai Chi program. So because many of, many of those who would attend are in wheelchairs and or can walk somewhat but probably many would not be able to do the we did a half hour we do a half hour class that would be quite long for them to stand up so i created a uh, seated program um and it had so it, it was a specific program and for those who were say frail but not dementing persons they could follow most of the movements and do the breathing exercises. And uh, so that went very well. And in, at your care center and Windsor Court, especially we had, oh, 10, 15, 20, 25, maybe 30 people come out at different times. So it was, it was very, very uh, rewarding. Um, and then at some point I was asked if, uh, if I would be interested in doing a, a class to uh, in Birch Grove at York Care Center, which is the dementia home. And I said, well, um, yeah, let's, let's see what happens. Let's try it out. So we did that. And I, by the way, always have some very soft music playing in the class too. And uh, some, some of the participants have said over the years, you know, the movement is great, the breathing, but I love the music. I, I just come, I just come here for the music. It's really good. So, um, so that kind of leads into uh, talking about this dementia, the, the dementia group Tai Chi and narrative care, um, because in the dementia uh, with dementia persons. And I used to do, just by the way, I used to do a regular class and then I also did a, uh, a day class. Um, so the family would drop off their dementia loved one for a, a program of uh, a day program. And we'd also have a Tai Chi class in there. So their folks are at different, uh, Razeb was mentioning, there's some uh, work has been done uh, tai Chi with dementia persons at earlier uh, levels, earlier stages. Um, well, I would be working with some from earlier stages and some not in earlier stages. They, they were further along. Uh, some didn't speak, some didn't move very much, um, but they would come to the class and uh, for, first of all, I guess the most dramatic effect that the staff used to point out to me is that these folks would sit still for half an hour and they're used to moving. Uh, most of them just moving all the time. So the fact that they could come and sit quietly for half an hour was huge and also helpful to the uh, staff uh, that that would happen. They, they almost well, they told me they had a break as well. And if they followed the class, they had another way of learning some good stuff. Um, so we could tell moving into kind of stillness talk, narrative care, stillness, and Tai Chi. They, those, I would say, it's kind of a stillness practice and a stillness moment where the residents and the staff and volunteers would all benefit from this. Um, in terms of what I would teach there, uh, there, there is a set of movements, and I would slowly go through the movements. Another part of the narrative care is that I would kind of notice, this takes a little experience, but uh, I would kind of notice which movements they would do, or many of them would do, and ones that they wouldn't do. And uh, so if I saw one that they did kind of tried to do, I'd go back to it. 
I do a couple more movements and I go back to that one and they could do it again. So uh, that's a form of narrative care, I would say, is kind of observing and watching as opposed to a standard program with a standard objective and a standard outcome that everybody has to do. And uh, that's another way of training folks to do classes like this. Um, and I used to have some students, uh, uh, kinesiology students from the university come to my classes. And um, first time they came, they would notice that somebody wasn't moving an arm or a leg and they would go over and try and help them. And I'd call them aside and say, um, excuse me, sit down, enjoy the class if you'd like to, but don't correct them. Please don't correct them. Because that's the first, th first sign and it's very visible, someone with dementia or not, doesn't want to be told what to do. <laughs> and, uh, and so they would get upset, they get visibly upset. So anyway, once they got this, they hopefully learned another way uh, of being with folks to do these kinds of programs, but doing them in a different way. Um, so they're not necessarily getting the physical benefit of, uh, of doing all the movements. Um, the breathing is also crucial if they can manage to um, follow you know, a certain type of breathing, then uh, that's really helpful. Um, so the actual movements are almost secondary in those types of classes. Um, many of the participants will watch the movements. So that helps to slow them down, I think. They're, they like to watch me, but they don't necessarily have to do anything. And that's how I introduce every class. Um, it would be, especially with dementia persons who may not remember anything from one week to the next. Um, I always start from the beginning and I always tell them, you can uh, follow the music, you can just have a nap. And usually that gets a bit of a laugh. You, you can just do nothing. You can watch me, you can do what you like. And if you don't like it, leave. <laughs> and this, approach from, from my experience takes all the pressure off. Uh, first of all, they're not looking at me as this person, this professor or whatever coming in and telling me what to do and expecting me to do things a certain way or measure up to something. Um, I, I would speculate, I'm sure there's maybe some literature on this, but with dementia, a lot of it is new. I would venture to say that all human beings no matter what level of frailty or fitness we are, have that sense of self-esteem, of, of being listened to and not being pushed or told what to do. Um, so this approach just calms everything down before anything really starts in the class. It just calms everything down. Everybody feels that I'm just one of them. I'm just with them. And, you know, God be willing, I am one of them. You know, I, I have a good, I have a good friend who coincidentally happens to be a Tai Chi teacher and he was di just diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And, you know, you just never know. We, we, none of us know. Now, hopefully with him, he's really, he's trained all his life. And hopefully some of the benefits of that training will carry him along. Uh, in his journey of the disease. Um, but I'm, I'm just suggesting that that could be me next month, next year. I, I have no idea. So I just have this sense of connection with these folks. And, uh, and I think they feel that. I think uh, if you're able to, as somebody leading a, a group like this, if you can get that feeling, you're away. You're do, you'll be doing fine. Um, So it's not fixing, not trying to fix something or force them to do anything. Um, one of my, the other aspect of this is that uh, the, way, the way this class proceeds, it, to me, it, it creates um, uh, stillness. It creates a stillness environment. 
uh, with the participants and myself. In fact, there are times in the class where I find myself doing the movements and then I'll stop for a, a minute or so. And there's this wonderful peacefulness in this, in this room. It's palpable. And uh, so I don't do anything. I, I sometimes I'd say, you know, time, don't even know what time, but maybe three minutes or, or four minutes, just completely silent. It's just a wonderful feeling. Um, and, I, and I would say that as one of my Dutch colleagues who's done some, some of this type of practice, she says, with dementia persons, when you do Tai Chi, you go straight to the stillness. And she would say at the center of our story, that, that in our life stories, we have this stillness center, this silent center. Now you can believe that or not, but I certainly believe it. So dementia persons don't have nothing going on <laughs> and, uh, and don't just have, they may have a confused mind, but their spirit is quite intact, I think. Um, and so I agree with this idea that the, uh, the, the practice goes beyond the disease and goes straight to the stillness at the center of the story. That's pretty, pretty remarkable as we try to uh, understand more and engage more with, with those uh, dementia persons. Um, the last little bit about th this part of it, uh, in terms of a program, in terms of, of having people do a program like this, the benefits really are, uh, are there, there are benefits for everyone involved. You know, the long-term care community, residents, staff, volunteers, administrators, um, all members, we call it in narrative care, a biographical encounter. In other words, stories, my story and your story connecting as an encounter. So by, instead of a biological encounter, you could say a biographical encounter of stories. So a connection happens and it helps quality of life for everybody. Um, people tend to look at it, look, I think it's more becomes like person-centered care where I'm a person to them and they're a person to me. Uh, rather than an, an object to a subject, you know, like when you go to your doctor and they they might remember your name and uh, and start talking to you like you're a list of symptoms, and you and you start saying to yourself, "Is that person really talking to me?" You know, hearing what I have to say, that's like a textbook. So it, this this kind of approach changes that, and I know all of the person centered work does that it, its intense intention is to do that um and so the whole culture of an institution can can benefit from this if it's of interest and i know um some uh, some long-term care places in i know in our area but in the broader world are are using this it becomes a culture of the institution from the administrators down or aside to residents, people who are custodial staff, everyone has this uh, sense or sensitivity to uh, narrative care, to person-centered care. And perhaps there's a possibility for Tai Chi uh, in this kind of application for those to learn and share and, and um, yeah, increase that, ameliorate that, that benefit. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm really interested in this point around. So you have, I, I have it as well, you know, you have like this, you have stillness. And you've described people uh, living with dementia as living in a timeless now, I think in the past, I've heard you say that. Mm -hmm. And that's also for all of us, that moment of stillness is that, is that timeless now, actually, for all of us, I feel that moment, you know? Uh, and then you have this connection, I feel, with your emotional self and your cognitive self and their imbalance. It's not, often it's like, you know, I'm rationalizing, I'm thinking it through and I have to, you know, 
Whereas this this kind of instinctive moment, right? And then you do the thing that feels right, uh, that works. I think I'm beginning to ramble, maybe, but I, um, I, yeah, I'm. I mean, that's how I feel like when I have that stillness, and I mean that kind of, like you say, not thinking about the future, not affected by the past, as it were, just now. And then it kind of comes up and then I have the thought and then I do something and it's highly efficient doing. And it's exactly the thing that I want to do in the way that I want to do it uh, without wastage, without friction. And if I can keep that going, you know, then I've had a great day, right? Uh, It's beautiful. I haven't expended too much energy on things unnecessarily and I've just kind of gone from thing to thing. Uh, and in the zone, you're in the zone. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I, when you describe, um, I mean, it's a big thing, you know, uh, the culture of an organization, you know, every person's own character and culture is already like such a complex thing. Put it in an organization with all these externalities, you know, it's, it's a big thing. Um, so what I wondered, uh, and I, I know I kind of know the answer, but I'm priming you to say it. <laughs> it's like, so you have given classes and it's like, you know, half an hour a week. What if, say, the people in the organization uh, had some of the skills, like you say, it takes time, you know, to understand how to use it as a narrative tool, maybe, uh, were able to um, give for want of a better word, uh, guide, maybe a better word, uh, a Tai Chi or a Qigong moment throughout the day. So rather than half an hour a week, uh, people could try to use these tools uh, throughout the day. I mean, I mean, it's only by doing that you actually embed something, right? Could you see that being possible? Oh, uh, yeah, I think it's very possible. I think the, uh, um, there, <clears throat> excuse me, there would be the uh, a certain number of movements to learn and some, some sense of how to do those movements, Tai, tai Chi style without being a, a master. <laughs> yeah. You don't need to be a, a, you know, 20 years in Tai Chi to learn how to do these movements basic, basically. Um, and then uh, if the person who's leading or coordinating it just had this sense of uh, quiet, of, of uh, you know, you can learn that not to have expectations from the participants, uh, not to appear like you're, you know, as I say, improving them or fixing them or uh, making them feel that they don't, you know, uh, especially with dementia persons, as probably those of you in the audience know very well, there you you can be very sensitive to what you can't do anymore. Uh, so that if a person is leading a group with those kinds of feelings and assumptions, and can is comfortable with a little bit of quiet and not expecting this or that from the group. Then yes, definitely. I think it with a with some practice and some training, we call it that sense sensitivity to it. That could be possible, and then that would be wonderful because uh, rather than some well, lately no one's been able to to do this anyway, except by Zoom, um, uh, unless they have somebody maybe in their in their um, yeah. situation already. Yeah institution already but otherwise i think those would be the basic there there wouldn't be you know in tai chi they have many many movements in the traditional way of doing tai chi but over the years that's changed quite a bit in tai chi too because there was something like 108 movements and uh, many people these days say what (laughs) do you think i'm ever going to get to that now they probably could but they 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 need something more manageable at least to begin with to, yeah. to get the idea. Sure. So this this would be manageable, I think, uh, for for those who would have a, a sense of wanting wanting to do that and wanting to connect with this form of uh, 
narrative care and stillness. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what the reason uh, I mentioned, you know, half an hour a day, sorry, a week, and then this idea of a bed in, in an organization is, of course, um, there are many times within the flow of each day where we can all benefit from stillness. We can benefit from taking a moment to take things in, observe what's going on. Um, you know, I've been in quite some nursing homes and, you know, the moment uh, that the shift is changing sometime mid afternoon often say, or those moments uh, before dinner in the evening can be quite some moments of unrest, you know, because mm. there's just a lot's going on too. Maybe then the vibe just suddenly shifts, right? Um, or people are getting tired. Mm. And I think, you know, if every day for five or 10 minutes even then, so it's not even 30 minutes, uh, people in the team have the skills to, uh, to do some of these things. Uh, it can be wonderfully helpful just because then the dinner experience is better for everybody else. That shift change is much more uh, frictionless and smooth and not a moment of, you know, um, unpredictability or, yeah. uh, and so, I mean, what I guess what we're, then talking about is the team who's involved in on the work floor, um, uh, therapeutic activity professionals, personal support workers, uh, maybe RNs, LPNs, uh, registered nurses, uh, license. Yeah, uh, I mean, this is this is the team that we're talking about. Yeah, um, yeah, I think. It's very, uh, all you need, as you're, as you're pointing out, all you need, um, what was, I just heard something from uh, Harvard where they do a lot of research on all kinds of things. And they were saying a, a practice that can reduce your stress, they say by 30, 30% is by doing 10 deep breaths every hour for the day. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just go somewhere and do, uh, do 10 deep breaths. This kind of program can be that way with, uh, you know, there, there's one movement that I usually recommend if you don't remember anything in, in the class is, I don't know if you can see me here, but just raising the palms, breathing in from, from below, turning your palms over, breathing out, letting your palms float down. So just that one movement, you're breathing, your mind is coordinating gently, coordinating movements. So there's a cognitive thing going on. And it helps with that combination of things of coming to the present moment. You're getting this stillness, the po potential for feeling some stillness right away. Yeah. So as you're suggesting, you can go to a closet <laughs> or over in the corner somewhere. Yeah. And even two minutes, two or three minutes, you could do something like that. I'm glad you raised that because just doing a very short practice like that, but doing it fairly regularly, you'll progress. You'll That's feel right. better and better. It's yeah. just it's plugging yourself into that space on a regular basis, and it does it on its own. That's all. Yeah. You, you just need to show up. That's yeah. what I yeah. Yeah. talk yeah. a lot about in my book. It's you just need to show up. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, but well, because uh, I mean. My ex you experience something, and then I wanted to understand well, how does this relate to all the scientific stuff that I know, as it were, you know, Western science. And it actually seems quite simple, right? Uh, you breathe, you know, uh, and just by doing this coordinated act, you in this moment, and you're actually triggering and connecting with your nervous system and triggering your parasympathetic nervous, nervous system. It's your core physiology that you're just calming and coming into a kind of a rested state, right? That's, uh, I, say, I mean, I'm, I'm maybe, I'm even putting these definitions on it, narrows it, but it makes it also somehow concrete, maybe to some people. Uh, yeah, that's, that's true. There's an increasing amount of, uh, of um, <clears throat> neurobiology and uh, the chemicals that are, 
you know, this type of stillness practice um, activates our frontal cortex, our, our kindness, compassion, nurturing part of ourselves in contrast to our animal system, which is based on fear. And many of us have fear. And, uh, and so we're, by doing these practices, we are activating those neurotransmitters and, uh, and all kinds of things. I don't know them all, but oxy, oxytocin in the brain that creates this uh, calmness and um, can, can by itself calm certain illness conditions and health conditions and make us feel uh, better and better. So yes, I'm glad you pointed out because there's, I'm not uh, familiar with a lot of that, the details of that research, but there is more and more out there yeah, documenting yeah. that from a physiological yeah. perspective. Indeed, yeah. And I mean, effectively what you're saying is uh, what, what you, you've experienced and others experienced with you is that this works also for people with dementia. Living yes. With dementia. That's, I mean, that's actually a simple point, right? It's a, a continuation of the story of something being effective, helping you to exactly, a, exactly. a more qualitatively uh, better life. I mean, that's yeah. 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 Uh, I, I, mean, I knew this would happen. We, we just get talking and we start to run out of uh, time, <laughs> about five more minutes. So if there's any questions, please put it into the chat and we'll just keep talking and if there are then uh, in a few minutes uh, um, I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, so, actually, so I mean we've talked about this and I think we have come to the conclusion that we would uh, like to work together on a, uh, a pilot or maybe even a series of pilots to get it ready properly. Uh, course for say to begin with, we just target it, therapeutic activity professionals um, to see if we could, if you could transfer some of your knowledge and just get the ball rolling. So uh, after I think in a week or so, once we've had a chance to just edit and timestamp this video recording of this uh, conversation, along with that, we'll send out uh, a form with some back, more background and an expression of interest for anybody that wants to take part in a pilot to on a course. Um, and we haven't talked about it, Gary, in terms of specific dates, uh, but maybe, I mean, the, the spring and summer are coming. We should just enjoy that this year, a little bit mm -hmm. more COVID free than other years. Uh, but then maybe a, a, a first pilot starting around September. Does that sound okay to you? Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Great timing uh, to okay. have the summer and think and uh, yeah. or, or not think. <laughs> yeah, I feel. <laughs> Let it all crystallize and then yeah. just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And I, I mean, I have this, uh, usually if you want to introduce something into an already existing space, which is almost every space, <laughs> Um, the question is, yeah, but we have something or don't we have something that does this already? Uh, do you have some thoughts on other tools that people might be using now as tools for stillness then just for um, a narrative, I think, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, uh, <clears throat> like music therapy. Um, that's a, a great way for, uh, and I've talked in passing to a couple of music therapists and they use some of the same language that, that there's a quiet space created and folks calm down and uh, feel better. And, and a couple of them even said it, it is like a stillness that happens through, through music. Music, is, well, as we know, is very powerful. So um that would be one one approach and then i think uh, again in the netherlands i've i've had the the pleasure of learning quite a few things from uh what goes on in the netherlands and uh, uh there's a colleague there who does um storybook work so they they help the dementia person to uh put together a storybook perhaps with the family perhaps with actually that's done at 
uh, Daphne Noonan has been involved in something like that too. So, yeah. but that's another way of their uh, folks will focus to their ability, but there's no pressure. And if the materials are relevant to the person, they will be able to do things to some degree or another, or just appreciate being there in the, in the process of doing that activity. Um, I, I, I drawing or painting, I, again, in the Netherlands, I had a colleague who used to, um, and these were folks who were not in the beginning stages of dementia, they were further along. And they would be encouraged to just draw. Perhaps there'd be a, an object to draw, but it really didn't matter. They would draw whatever they wanted to draw. And again, there was I was there for one of these classes, and again there was this sense of calmness, and you know the teacher knew what she was doing too, and and uh, that was again kind of a stillness environment created with any of those kinds of activities. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. No, um, I'm going to suggest that we that we wrap up, uh, if that's okay. Um, um, it, it, here today is King's Day, so it's a national celebration, and uh, people have been locked up on King's Day for two years now. <laughs> <this> yeah, <year. laughs> I don't know. I had to mute a couple of times because the people are going by on boats and the horns are going off. And, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite fun. I think I'm going to jump in and join the uh, join yeah, it myself. Yeah, it's a lot of a lot of fun. Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah, it's a great celebration. Gary, thanks so much for your time and just the considered way that you explained uh, so much of this stuff. I mean, I, 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 we've talked about this before so many times. Uh, this topic, you know, uh, of the last I don't know, coming up to a year now. But um, I, each time I'm, I'm really affected and touched by how you uh, um, authentically you explain and, and, and connect with this. It's, uh, it's really, uh, I find it, it touches me. Yeah? It's, it's, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, thanks everyone. I, ho I hope you, who, anybody who joined and everybody who listens after uh, enjoy the conversation and, uh, and hope to engage with you on this uh, a couple more times through the course of the year, as because I, I think it's a, a larger topic that it's good to give it a bit more attention to cover, you know, the role of Tai Chi in dementia care. Uh, Could I make a final uh, comment? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I would encourage your listeners to look at the uh, the uh, best elder care on the, the robots. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I was quite struck by that uh, a lot, a lot of it, but in particular th that th it's a form of narrative care. <laughs> that the, ro the robots are designed to connect with a person, not the person connecting to. Yeah. just a robot yeah i thought that was very well just wonderful thing yeah to... yeah yeah i think i mean the, the way that uh wang nong lee that he comes at it i, I find quite special uh, mm -hmm. yeah it, it's uh yeah it's fantastic yeah and I, i'm i'm sure just because uh, uh how meaningfully uh they do it uh, that you know they're gonna it's gonna work out for them you know yeah. well because I think that they really uh, meet, meet a need you know such a uh, in such an elegant way yeah yeah, so. yeah. thank you enjoy the day you you too yeah <laughs> thanks everybody for coming yeah we talk soon bye bye. <laughs>